got a bit excited during afternoon tea and we lost track of time, which is why we're starting a bit late. So our apologies. I would go ahead and introduce our next speaker, our next presenter, um, whilst people are tripling it. So our next presenter is Dr. Makiko Nishitani, and her title for her presentation is The Production of Precariousness and the Racialization of Pacific Workers in the Australian Horticulture Industry. For those who are walking in, please keep it down. I'm introducing our next presenter. Makiko Nishani is a lecturer of anthropology in the Department of Social Inquiry at La Trobe University. Her research interests include migration and mobilities, kinship immigration statuses and gender. The recent research project, a collaboration with Helen Lee, examines Pacific Islanders' experiences working in horticulture industries in rural Australia. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to, um, let's give a round of applause for Makiko Nishitani. Uh, hello, um, can you hear me? Uh, so I'm gonna share screen now. So hopefully it's all shared and ready to go. So good. So this paper draws on ethnographic research, which was conducted in between 2014 and 2019 in Salvasia in the Northwest Victoria. The data collection for this presentation was guided by the project's Pacific Advisory Group comprised of leaders from Tongan, Fijian, Cook Island, and Solomon Island communities in the area. Through their guidance, we were able to conduct qualitative interviews and focus groups discussions. Our research participants include diverse ethnicities from the Pacific who have um, also differing migration statuses, Interviews were also conducted with representatives from stakeholders and service providers. Uh, for, for this presentation, uh, it's relevant, uh, especially about the school teachers. The main field site was uh, Mildura Robinville, this area is called Sunraysia. The main industry in Sunraysia is horticulture, more specifically table grapes almonds and oranges are very famous in this area. Similar to all the other horticulture and agriculture areas in Australia, Sunraysia's horticulture industries have had labor shortage for quite some time. According to a 2019 survey of 73 local growers in Mildura and Robinville and surrounding areas conducted by the Victorian Farmers Federation Horticulture Group, Quote, 67% of growers said they were understaffed and 71% of growers surveyed in Sunraysia believe they have irregular workers on their farms, quote end. An industry association official interviewed in another recent research project published in 2020 suggested that, quote, 80 to 90% of the Mildura and Robinville workforce were undocumented. As part of the strategy to resolve the labor shortage, Sunraysia has also participated in a seasonal worker program earlier since the beginning of its pilot program. In this area, Pacific people started migrate long before the seasonal worker program. Early Pacific migrants, initially from Tonga, were attracted by the job opportunities available on farms in the 1980s. Some of them did not have work permits and they came to the area due to the relative lack of surveillance in regional communities. Over time, some were caught and deported and others were able to gain permanent residency or Australian citizenship and continue to live and work in the area. Many Tongans among our research participants with permanent residency or Australian citizenship described their journey to regularize their migration statuses, which took some of them more than 20 years. One of the main characteristics of Pacific Islanders in Sunraysia we would like to draw attention to is that 
not only seasonal worker participants, but people with diverse range of migration statuses are working on farms in very similar role as so-called vocational skilled work or unskilled work. Uh, it means like including harvesting, being paid by peace rates, working in packing shed with other people like working holiday makers and so on. So this workforce include Pacific, not only seasonal worker participants, but include Pacific people who acquire Australian citizenship or permanent residency. Also include, um, here include Australian born children of migrants. Also people from New Zealand who migrate to Australia through trans tasman Treaty. This includes, for example, Cook Islanders that is in free association with New Zealand. Obviously, Cook Islanders do not participate in seasonal worker program as they have New Zealand passport and they don't have legal constraints to migrate to Australia like other Pacific people like Tongans or Fijian do. But they moved to Sanresia in search for income opportunities in horticulture industries, just like other Pacific people. In addition, uh, irregular migrants, uh, which in an Australian government term, I believe it's UNC, unlawful known citizens, are also working as discussed before. These include overstayers who stay in Australia beyond their visa expiry day, or so-called absconders who left seasonal worker program for various reasons. In terms of migration statuses, legal status and um, entitlements in Australia, like rights to stay and rights to work, with, and also which countries they are from, they are all different. But most of them are engaged in the same industry, often in the same or similar employment conditions, irrespective of migrant statuses. Uh, so therefore, the main argument of this paper is that many analysis of migrant work have highlighted migrant status as source of precariousness. And this was demonstrated not only in Australia, but also internationally, for example, in Canada and in the UK. Example of precariousness, precarious migrant status in these discussion include temporary visa and irregular visa statuses. However, we argue that experiences of migrants from the Pacific and their children born in Australia highlight another source of precariousness in employment, which is racialization. So race is understood here as a social construction that is significant because of its persistent ordering role in social relations, including in the extraction of labor and as fundamental for an understanding coloniality. Coloniality. Racialization is understood as the process whereby racial significance is ascribed to groups by others. So to support our argument in the rest of this presentation, we'll show case studies from um, our interview. Empirical studies have already shown that precariousness, precariousness at work emerges directly from regulations of the seasonal worker program. Workers have no right to move between different employers while working under the seasonal worker program. In addition, uh, seasonal workers bear the risk of income insecurity if, if they are taken to farms that have a poor harvest or are employed by contractors that do not fulfill their duty regarding pastoral care and well being of workers. They need to see their contract out without having the right to change employers. For example, during the field work, we encounter a young man as uh, pseudonym um, Semisi. Uh, Semisi is a 20 year old man from Tonga. At the time we met him, he was employed in a seasonal worker program and harvested tomatoes in Queensland, but left his work because he only received $150 a week after deductions for insurance, accommodations and transport. Once the harvest was over, the employer could not find any jobs and Semisi and his group were left without jobs for one month. During this time, diaspora communities in the surrounding area visited them and provided food. 
After a month, a contractor found another tomato farm to work. However, the harvest was poor and the contractor deducted accommodation fees for the month where Semisi did not earn any income. After two weeks, he and other group members decided to leave. Semisi traveled from Queensland to Mildura as he had a family here. He became an absconder, so his visa was canceled and he lost work rights and access to healthcare. However, he said he made a good decision because he has a responsibility to send money to his family back home, which he could not achieve while he was a legal seasonal worker program participant. At the time of the interview, he was working on farm as an irregular migrant and sending money to Tonga. Second generation Tonga woman who lives with Semisi said the court here, who specifically blamed the pro seasonal worker program as a source of creating over overstayers and irregular migrants. Observing how limited movement is available for seasonal workers, uh, it is common that uh, we, we hear about the diaspora community's observation that being of the overstayer might be better than coming to Australia under the seasonal worker program because it have a free movement and more autonomy uh, compared to a uh, regulated uh, temporary migration scheme like seasonal worker program. Also, having said that, also irregular migrants can move between different employers. They experience uh, precarious work too. And also settler who theoretically should have more protection and stability also experience very similar precarious work. So here you can see uh, we put the uh, irregular migrants court and the settler, but um, irregular migrant Alice and uh, Australian citizen Mele, but uh, they had pretty much similar experience about late pay issues with payment. And also both of them did not know how to respond to the program. In addition to precariousness, precariousness related to payment, both settlers and irregular migrants highlighted experiences of occupational health and safety breaches, such as having to work while chemicals are being sprayed. Irregular migrants experienced even more severe breaches of um, occupational health and safety risks, such as not being granted access to water. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> not being granted access to water on 40 degrees days. So we encounter a number of people who experienced late payment in combination with undercut by contractors. And this is not unique to people who recently migrated from the Pacific, but also young people who grew up in Australia. John, a Cook Islander man in his 20s, revealed that his employer never stated the rate of pay, but conceded that he appreciates any income. Although he had grown up in Brisbane, he still refers to being from the islands and thankful for anything or anything like that. So far, I hope that it becomes clear that even settlers who have Australian citizenship or permanent residency experience precariousness at work. So this raises the question about why many Pacific Islanders continue to work in this industry, in this horticulture area. Why a small number of people have started to develop careers in other areas, Many Pacific people living in regional areas struggle to find jobs outside the highly casualized horticultural sector. One of the common phrases that appeared in interviews and focus group discussion was, it's not about choice. We argue that farm work in regional Victoria has become structured by racialized demand for types of workers and this racialization prevents many migrant settlers and even the children of migrants from finding jobs outside the horticultural sector. The racialization of farm work, particularly for Pacific people and its historical relevance to blackbirding has been discussed in the context of the temporary migration schemes, such as Fry John Cornell, Kirsty Petro and Victoria Stead. 
instead, for example, uh, demonstrates that historical relevance of blackbirding for contemporary Pacific labor mobility in Australia, since the introduction of temporary migration schemes, quote, Pacific Islander workers are promoted to farmers through labor hire company and government marketing as well suited, as well suited to horticulture labor, quote, and and similar discourse can be found in local media uh, from uh, this uh, is from Shepparton, another regional area, local newspaper. The stereotype Pacific people as farm workers are prevalent and diaspora community members are widely aware of them. Not only migrants, but when we did focus group discussion with our high school students, the stereotype as a fruit picker was raised as a raised a lot as a problem for them. The direct implication of the racialization of work is that many people struggle to find a job outside the horticulture industry. Even those are research participants who did not have any visa problems and had skills and work experience struggle to find a job. Uh, this quote is from Lita, a Tongan woman in her 50s used to work in a library in Sydney, but uh, she had to move to Mildura because her mother wanted to, her to join her. She did not want to work on farm and initially she believed that she could find a job given her previous experience. She moved to Mildura in 1994 and she finally found a job in 2014, experiencing 20 years of unemployment in the area. The difficulty of finding a job outside of the horticulture sector is not only experienced by migrants, but also their children. Uh, this one uh, is from James, 19 years old Cook Islander man who was born and raised in Mildura. He was looking for a job after, at the time of the interview, he was looking for a job after completing year 12 and when invited for a job interview, encountered a racialization typically inflicted against job applicants who sound local because they have grown up in Australia, yet are discriminated against on the basis of racial stereotypes. In addition to the stereotype of farm workers, many research participants raised criminalized images of Pacific people and their low social economic status as barriers in their employment search, employment search. The quote from this 21-year-old uh, Tongan woman is from a focus group, focus group we did with uh, second generation Tongans in the local area. Most of the Tongan and Cook Islander students who participate in interviews and focus groups indicated that the stigma of fruit pickers and other negative stereotypes impact them. When they were asked why it is hard to break the stereotype as farm worker, one participant said, quote, it's all these freshies coming over here still working in the farm when we are trying to stay away from it, quote, and while the children of Pacific migrants are trying to find jobs outside the horticulture sector, they feel that the seasonal worker program participants keep reinforcing the widespread image of migrants from Pacific as a farm workers. These stereotypes impact young people's career development. At our focus group of um, high school teachers, one teacher explained that she found it hard to find apprenticeships for Pacific students saying, quote, can I just really be honest though? I'll tell you what our business people are saying. They won't employ because of the unreliability. Some don't turn up, quote, and While the stereotype of farm workers and other negative images are widely recognized in a regional horticulture towns, Pacific settlers become invisible in the context of public support for vulnerable, marginalized populations in the region, which is mainly targeted at refugees and indigenous Australians. At one of the teachers' workshops, one of the participants said, 
pointed out how most of the supports are directed to Kuri students and students from Muslim backgrounds. So she basically know what phone number to contact if it's Kuri students or Muslim background, but they, she, they don't know who to contact if it's a Pacific student who, who need uh, support. So in conclusion, um, the exclusive focus on temporary seasonal workers as Pacific migrants in regional area, in fact, masked the persistent effect of the racialized stigma on Pacific migrant workers and their children uh, who can live and work and uh, settle in Australia. The horticulture workforce in Australia is comprised of people on varying migration statuses, Focused on people from different Pacific Island states, uh, this paper has examined how different migration status impact um, their experiences as workers. Many studies on migrant work have demonstrated how inequality and precariousness in employment are produced through migration policies and specific visa regulations, which had made workers more vulnerable to exploitation. Our research demonstrates how precarious employment conditions in horticulture work impact Pacific people across and beyond different legal statuses. Even those who hold Australian citizenship or permanent residency and are thus legally unrestricted in their pursuit of employment opportunities experience wage theft through under and non-payment of old wages as well as occupational health safety risk as uh, horticulture workers. For workers with irregular legal status, these conditions are often exacerbated. However, differences in migration status do not explain these experiences sufficiently. The struggle of Cook Islanders who can come and live in Australia freely and of the children of Pacific migrants who are born and raised in Australia in finding job outside the horticultural sector and the experience of precariousness in horticultural work demonstrate that there are other factors at play that are largely ignored in both analysis of focusing on temporary migrant status and analysis of the political economy of the horticultural sector. The prevalent stereotype about Pacific people as hard and reliable farm workers and other negative stereotypes both normalizes their exploitation and restricts their opportunities as job seekers outside the horticultural sector. To understand Pacific people's experiences of persistent precariousness, it's important to look beyond migrant statuses and employment conditions and understand how the racialization of farm work impacts their employment experiences within and beyond the horticulture sector. Uh, thank you very much. I finished the presentation. Thank you so much, Makiko Nishitani, for um, your very important research that you presented to all of us here. Um, I'll have a look on Zoom to see if there are any questions that have been put up by our online Zoomers. I do encourage you all to participate. And if you have any burning questions, please um, don't be afraid to ask. But in the meantime, here in the audience, is there any burning questions from anyone here? Okay, I have one. Um, <laughs> I was really interested about um, issues of racism that's been occurring in the employment um, sector, particularly by people who are children of the migrant workers who were born here in Australia. And um, I know that it's an, not an uncommon thing. It's something that's, um, you know, I'm not surprised, but it's also just interesting for me to hear it again that these things are still happening um, at the employment sector in general. What are some ways I can understand the importance of understanding the experiences of racism in the employment sector, but what are some ways that you think that we could help um, reduce issues of racism happening and occurring? Because then obviously it would affect the employment trajectory of our young Pacific people who are born here, but even just migrants in general who come and 
who are being, um, you know, experiencing racism in terms of whether that be in terms of income or whether that be in terms of, you know, the, with the simple thing of how they were in that area in the in their farm and how they were spraying the chemicals, even though they're in that area. So, like, what are some ways do you think that we could protect um, migrant workers as well as um, children of migrants um, from experiencing these types of racism in the employment um, sector. Um, thank you very much for a very important question. Um, yeah, so the um, we it's a it's very um, um, the career development of uh, second generation Pacific migrants in a uh, high school is very important and uh, often like uh, um, when we in interview school teachers we noted that there's some uh, like unconscious bias about uh, Pacific people Pacific students instead of doing uh, BCE to go to university they unconsciously may be recommended to do VCAR to go to vocational uh, careers and stuff like that. So there's some unconscious bias and those kind of thing uh, is very embedded in an area. And I'm not sure how to, um, there's a no clear um, solution, but one of the thing at the moment uh, we are doing uh, with the collaborator is a uh, uh, creating a more, on, uh, actually online resources about the, um, like, as I said a little bit, um, there are a small number of people who actually develop their career as like a school teachers and uh, uh, develop some uh, occupied work, find a job opportunities in a different area. So uh, we, uh, we are trying to create some resources for young people to um, see Make, make it visible, there's uh, some uh, different pathways uh, because there's a, when we interview young people, there's a bit of uh, extreme idea that if you can't go to university or if you can't become rugby player, you have to work on farm. So we try to um, find a way to give more information resources that even if you don't want to go to university, you can go to TAFE and you can get this skill and you can do some different jobs. And yeah, uh, those kind of things, um, we are hoping that will help some, uh, to give them some more options in Australia. Thank you. Oh, hopefully it makes it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Maki. I think the, when you had shared that, um, how the experiences of some of our Pacific children within the high schools, I remember myself, just sharing a little personal experience here. Um, I remember myself when I was in high school in my last year of year 13. So in New Zealand, we got up to year 13, not year 12. And I remember my um, year 13 year advisor when I was contemplating on whether or not I should take music or whether or not I should go down the health route because I wanted to be a doctor. My advisor had told me that, oh, no, it's better for you if you just go to music because you're more likely to get into music and not be a doctor. And um, so there's that type of discouraging um, kind of advice that you hear from people who you're meant to be looking up to for advice and people you're meant to be um, gaining encouragement from to help you succeed and progress and move out of, you know, somewhat... Uh, climb up the socioeconomic ladder. And, you know, it's, I was thankful enough that I was quite a stubborn student. And, um, and so I, I went obviously the health route. Um, and so I know, I'm not a doctor now, so thank God that um, <laughs> if, she, if she knew that um, she actually helped me to um, show her that no, I can't become a doctor and that I'm not gonna be part of the statistic of Pacific people who have low education or low qualifications. And so I think um, I totally agree with your response there, Makiko, in terms of um, ensuring that we have proper, you know, people in the education system that could help provide proper um, encouragement and reinforcement for Pacific people and that they can, whether they don't want to or not, but that they can do whatever it is that they want to. Um, 
in terms of the, their career. Is there any other last minute comments or questions from the audience? Yes, Mike. Thank you for a great presentation. Um, I was just wondering whether as part of the study, you considered the um, fairly long history of labor migration to the Sun Raja area. Uh, people have been sort of going there to pick fruit for probably almost a hundred years now sort of thing. Um, I was just wondering if the experiences of the different sort of cohorts who've um, sort of come through the horticultural industry in that area might usefully inform um, thinking about the more recent experience of people from the Pacific. Thank you very much for um, Ananda. Yeah, um, that's a very also important thing. Um, so uh, South Asia area is uh, known as very multicultural area. And um, there's like a, uh, one of the notable thing is uh, about the uh, uh, people from Italy, like Italian migrants and Greece and Mediterranean uh, people came after the World War II. Um, they created uh, some kind of a successful myth. So they came as a fruit pickers, saved money, purchased farm and become farmer. So basically at the moment, Pacific people's uh, employer, farmers are uh, basically those Italian and uh, Greek migrants, basically. So there's uh, some assumption that if you work hard and endure, you have a uh, like a bright opportunity like people, like Italian people. But the problem is like uh, things have changed, land is very expensive, and it's not like a good old 60s, 40s, 50s where you can save money and purchase the land because you know there's a global transnational agribusiness came in, and the way Australia does a horticulture, Australia structure of horticulture changed, but the uh, definitely the like a myth of successful migrants impact the I think uh, create some kind of politics. And also uh, I, I, ex I actually cut out this bit, but um, there's some uh, ex exclusive networks in a regional town in a sense that Italian people own shops and this ethnicity own this kind of industry. So as a Pacific people who, whose parents are working on farm, it's very hard if you if they want to stay locally, it's very hard to get into uh, other jobs because of the uh, lack of uh, social networks uh, in that industry. And that's also a bit of a problem. So one thing is like, if you want to be successful, you have to leave town and you have to, uh, uh, but uh, for fact, because, um, Pacific people place importance on family. Sometimes they make decision to stay together with parents and then work on farm become another, again, become option. Yeah. It's true, but I would note that Italians also traditionally find family pretty important also, and they were able to, I don't know quite really, I don't know the history of the area in detail, but it just seems interesting to sort of like probably bring that depth to the study. Oh, yes, definitely. Thank you so much, Murky Shani. Let's all give a round of applause to. Now I would like to present our very last presenter for today, um, our, the lovely Henrietta McNeil. The title of her presentation is called Problematizing Criminal Deportation and Reintegration in the Pacific. Henrietta began her PhD candidacy at ANU in 2020, last, was it last year? Last year. She has worked widely across the Pacific region with a particular interest in Polynesia. Henrietta's research looks at the security effects of criminal deportations to the region. She is particularly interested in the risk posed by criminal deportations and links to transnational crime. Let's give a round of applause for our last speaker, Henrietta. Thanks, Gina. Fako lofa lahiatu, talofa lava. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of this land and the Nangamal people, um, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. 
Um, I realised that my title, Problematising Contemporary Criminal Deportation and Reintegration in the Pacific, seems like it's going in the slightly opposite direction of what everyone else has talked about today. But um, what I wanted to show was some of the unintended consequences of migration to and from the Pacific. Um, and that sometimes migration back to the Pacific is forced and outside of migrants' hands. Um, there are many flow on effects of return migration. And these are sometimes exacerbated when it's people who are unwilling to go, quote, home, um, who have families back in the country of migration, um, such as Australia, um, and who may not have been there for many decades or actually at all in their lives. Um, so is it return at all? By problematizing this issue, it opens up new, new avenues for research. Um, and this helps us to consider reintegration for criminal deportees as different to other return migration. As we've discussed today, um, Islanders migrated for many reasons, whether it was work, study, following family and other new opportunities. Pacific Islanders tend to move to the United States, New Zealand and Australia, um, which Helen Lee refers to as the Pacific Triangle. However, as migration increased due to globalization and citizenship of independent nations, um, so did removal by deportation due to policy and legislative changes um, until, quote, the drastic nature of deportation or removal is now virtually inevitable for a vast number of non-citizens convicted of crimes. Criminal laws define and prescribe behavior and provide for the punishment of convicted non-offenders. Deportation is the sovereign right of states who can determine the threshold by which to exclude a person from their borders if they do not hold citizenship of this state. Criminal deportations themselves are made on the basis of criminal laws being broken and the punishment exceeding the threshold of the immigration administrative law um, for, for deportation. Each state has a differing threshold um, meaning that deportees from different countries will arrive having different levels of criminality um, when they arrive in their, in their receiving state, and they'll have different deportation experiences, and that might include detention or it may not. Um, in the context of the Pacific Triangle, I understand these laws to be the ones on your screen, um, which enable deportations from New Zealand, Australia and the US. Deportation decisions are predominantly intended to reduce the risk to the deporting state. The threshold for deportation is based on the severity of crimes committed and the significance of criminal history is reducing in many deporting states. So that's basically expanding the number of persons for whom deportation is an applicable sentence. Deporting states are thus, quote, ex exporting a problem and it's therefore the choice of the deporting state. As you can see, returns to the Pacific have increased in recent years due to changes in government policy. For example, Australia sent three returnees to each of Samoa and Tonga for the period 1998 to 2008. By contrast, in 2017 alone, Australia detained 57 Tongan born returnees in custody for eventual removal. The data in front of you has been collected from Freedom of Information Act requests to the immigration departments in each of these Pacific states. Uh, Pacific Triangle states, sorry. There are some issues with the data, but that's a story for another day. Overall, it, it gives us a sense that while we know the problem's increasing, the evidence surrounding it is unclear. Overall, deportee criminality to the Pacific ranges the full spectrum, from driving under the influence to serious and or sexual assault and grievous bodily harm. Some returnees have significant criminal histories and time incarcerated both in prison and subsequent immigration detention. But others who have been deported on bad character grounds um, may never have actually been to prison. Pereira has done the most in-depth study on Dongan Samoan deportees, but that was back in 2011. And it details the length of incarceration, which is likely linked um, to the level of criminality. Um, as you can see, Prior to detention, most deportees here have not served the most severe sentences. However, with legislative changes from deporting countries, this is actually likely increased. So for example, with Australia's law enforcing deportation after a 12 month cumulative sentence, um, there are likely to be more deportations now of those who have been incarcerated for less than two years. 
levels of criminality then differ by deporting states. For example, a Tongan police analysis suggests that, quote, deportees from Australia and the US had more links to organised crime and drug trafficking compared to those from New Zealand. So what does this mean for the Pacific? Tonga alone has seen over a thousand deportees arrive on its shores from the Pacific Triangle in the last decade, and Samoa at least 300. For Tonga though, this is 1% of the population. And when broken down uh, by uh, age and gender, it's actually more like one in 10 of the male workforce. These changes in societal composition have huge effects on interactions especially when many of the members of the male workforce are also overseas on seasonal work programs, so it changes those levels again. Persons of Pacific citizenship who are returned often face challenges in reintegration compared to those who are going to countries with similar languages and cultures, like New Zealand or, or the UK, which they don't face. Chief amongst these challenges is that language or cultural traditions of Pacific states may not be shared, and they may have moved from their Pacific home at a very young age. In addition, there is a, quote, widespread lack of sympathy for deportees in some Pacific states. Returnees can be perceived to have wasted opportunities overseas, perhaps a reflection on lost remittances or opportunities to earn while imprisoned, um, and on their arrival in small develop developing states with limited opportunities, Weber and Powell suggest that many returnees face stigma and are once more excluded, this time from village and family life, and face challenges in finding work, accommodation, and social support. So how does society respond? I'll now explore reintegration, and in particular, those who are forced through deportation to attempt to reintegrate in Pacific states. Note from here on, I'm gonna to to, uh, refer to deportees as returnees, um, as this is how many Pacific states refer to them. I understand reintegration of that person on their arrival as the process of joining society and gaining inclusion and acceptance into a community, which could be expressed as simply as a gesture of hello, um, at a smile, or it could be wider and include accessing accommodation in a village or employment. Many returnees are confused about where their home is. Pereira notes that 40% of criminal deportees have been outside of Samoa or Tonga for 20 to 30 years, and that they don't consider their state of origin as their real home. My research similarly shows that most of Australia's deportees to the Pacific arrived before the age of 16 and left after the age of 40. The sense of loss of home is immense. This is the time when you develop your friendships, your families, you, you make a family, you might get married and have a career. So Brotherton and Barrios say that most deportees, in particular those who have migrated as children, do not retain their homeland identity, instead considering themselves members of the society they were deported from. So if it was Australia, they'd consider themselves more Australian. Psychologically feeling abandoned, depressed and estranged in their supposed homeland, this displacement can have mental and physical health effects. Stigmatization is seen as a key issue within the literature of barriers that deportees or returnees face. Pantano suggests that a sense of belonging could be understood in, both, in relation to both a migrant's sense of attachment to a place, as well as how they are perceived by others, including social perceptions of stigma or othering. The stigmatization creates barriers to inclusion and access to means of living, such as employment, income, and accommodation. 62% of returnees in one study experienced barriers to employment related to stigmatization. Many returnees discuss the shame of having no money or employment prospects and having to turn to support facilities if there are any, feeling that they have no alternatives. Financial stigmatization also shows up in other ways. Pereira notes one case where a returnee's family in America stopped sending remittances to the Pacific on their return. Um, and the shame was incre increased when the returnee could not gain employment and so turned to selling marijuana. Often stigmatization is based on perceived and tangible dis differences from the society that the returnee is attempting to reintegrate into. Difference or attachment is construed through actions and visual indicators and language, or markers which are either familiar 
or unfamiliar, which help a group associate and make judgments as to whether someone is part of their group or not. Brotherton and Barrios um, note that locals, quote, can, stop a, uh, can spot a deportee from afar, their dress, their walk, their language, or give them away. Tattoos have become one of these markers of difference, where Rome Powell suggests that Samoan returnees are stigmatized based on their, return, on their tattoos. However, unlike in Latin and Central America, within the Pacific, there could be contention with the assertion that there is stigmatization of criminal deportees based on their tattoos. As Samoan society is heavily tattooed, and this is seen as mana or power. However, the images and style of tattoo are more likely the issue in this case. Westernized tattoos or gang signifiers would most likely indicate that a returnee was from elsewhere in an otherwise culturally tattooed society and essentially others them. The Samoan phrase, it's a more more lingutu, on a ta ai loa le tatao, roughly meaning tattoo your tongue before your body, is a cultural reference to people understanding their own culture and language before getting a culturally appropriate tattoo suggesting that deportees who carry Western tattoos or gang signifiers may not fit into society linguistically or culturally. Criminal deportees such as Shane Martin, on the other hand, are less critical of body art, but also note the treatment that they receive for it. Quote, I'm a bikey and I'm tattooed, sure, but that doesn't make me an S bag. Language itself is another marker of difference. Many scholars report language barriers as a significant issue for deportees. Not only does the language barrier hinder access to employment and social networks, but only speaking the language of the state of deportation and with an accent um, sets the returnees apart. Brotherton and Barrios uh, describe this paradox, quote, on the one hand, having English is a great skill in the tourism driven marketplace, and on the other, a, sig a way to signal the deviance of the newcomer. Likewise, 80% of Pereira's Samoan and Thongan respondents noted culture and language as the biggest barriers to their reintegration and made statements such as, I can't speak my Thongan language as such, but it is getting better slowly. Deportees often feel set up to fail and possibly reoffend by having limited opportunities and resources at the point of their deportation. For deportees to Samoan and Thonga, a lack of family ties and money in their home country has led some to, of the deportees to reoffend by selling drugs. And researchers suggest that recidivism be looked into in the future. In New Zealand alone, between 30 and 44% of, de of deportees from Australia reoffend. In Samoa, the Returnees Charitable Trust, Trust estimates that recidivism is more like 1 to 2%, uh, but there are reports of se uh, significant serious assault. Um, by returnees. Dingerman and Rumbelt note that not only do deportees turn to crime, but they're also the targets of crime, which increases that feeling of exclusion. There's also research linking US deportees and increased drug use. Drug use has increased in the Pacific over the last 10 years, and Pacific states have uh, considered legislation which has further police surveillance specifically for returning offenders, basically in order to curb recidivism. Likewise, US deportations have been clearly linked to gang membership, drug trafficking and supply, and increased violence. Jared Savage provides examples of New Zealand returnees scrolling gang social media while, quote, yearning for the Sydney high life and sending messages of offers to transport drugs to gain that network that they'd lost on their return. When an entire chapter of the Comancheros gang was deported from Brisbane to a local New Zealand town, um, it led to 17 arrests, 263 charges linked to firearms, and even more subsequent charges of drug importation. Returnees are working with the gangs they knew in the deporting country. It would not be improbable to think that Pacific returnees from Australia would have the same connections and networks having been in the same criminal and immigration detention centres. Savage de describes the ethnic composition of gangs as a strong draw card, where deportees admired the Comanchero gang's ostentatious displays of wealth and their seemingly tight bonds of brotherhood, in large part due to their members' shared Thongan heritage. 
I do question whether one of the possible consequences of not feeling secure in a home identity might be turning to something like gang membership where you feel more included and other subsequent activities such as transnational criminal activity. So I've covered a range of individual issues, reintegration, stigma, societal acceptance, deportation laws, and there are a number of ways of which we can look into this problem. Unfortunately, geographically, most of the literature is based on the US and the UK, particularly deportations to Latin America. Um, and very little research has actually been done in the Pacific, um, in which each state and culture has its own nuances and, and ways of reintegrating people. Um, although Samoa has been highlighted in two studies and Thunga in one PhD thesis, the Pacific region is generally under-researched in this area. I propose that this is an area ripe for, for research, and there are many ways in which we can investigate it, from the consequences of criminal deportations on transnational crime to the health outcomes of criminal deportees in the Pacific, particularly around mental health. Um, to the family structures of migrants in Pacific Triangle states who have had their family members deported. And we can also apply um, IR theory, such as inclusion, exclusion, and securitization. Um, and I urge uh, everyone to look into this area more because I think it's an area in which we can do a lot more research. So, Fafta Delilava. Thank you so much, Henrietta, for such an um, informative presentation on looking at the problematizing of the criminal justice system and issues of deportation um, back to people's home of origin. Um, is there any questions from online? No? Okay, any questions from or comments from the audience, please? Quite a few. Thank you for a very interesting um, presentation. One question that came to my mind uh, in terms of the deportation, I, I'm wondering if, or maybe you covered it, but I, I'm not really sure if you do look, look into the, the cultural aspects of immigration policy that drives or lead to that the problem that those people are in, and as a, as a result, they commit a crime that consequently they are deported. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Korabla. Um, I, I do, so I, I probably should have um, prefaced my comments with, I'm just at the end of my first year of my PhD, and I've, I've still got a lot of research to go and, and do my own data collection, but um, absolutely, I am doing some research into, into why are people getting deported and, and is it disproportionate to, to other groupings and, and uh, particularly for some countries it, it does look like it might be so, so yeah. Okay. And, and the reason why I'm raising this comment because with my PhD that has been published, uh, one Kiribati social worker in New Zealand used it to um, try to understand the problem of uh, one giddy best guy was in prison. So in when she was trying to understand this person and then she realized that the problem that he has, has connections with the Pacific access category and lead to some kind of mental illness. So as a result, the judge, when they read her statements, they said, oh, so it gives them an insight of why that person is doing that. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions? Hi, thank you for a really informative presentation. Um, I just wanted to ask in the limited research you've done so far, um, what kind of reintegration policies and programs do you think would be most useful for these people when coming home that could be implemented in, in the returning countries in the Pacific? Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure I know all the answers just yet, but I, I have noticed that there are differences in, um, so Samoa and Tonga do, do tend to get the uh, biggest numbers of uh, returnees um, south of the Micronesian states. Um, and so Samoa and Tonga have very different approaches to reintegrating uh, returnees. Um, in particular, uh, Tonga focuses on um, mental health and, and drug and alcohol addiction and, and those types of things. Um, and the Samoan approach is um, 
uh, more based around uh, there's a, a strong religious aspect, um, but there's also a lot around um, skills development, um, in particular in IT. Um, and so, and these are both um, NGO led. Um, and so I think uh, it's interesting to see uh, government and NGOs and, and how they are doing these differently in different countries. And yeah, I look forward to seeing um, how it works in different ways. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Henrietta. That's fascinating. And I think it's really very topical. I was curious, um, I know you're focusing a lot on the reintegration to Samoa and Tonga, and you did mention some of the deportees of Samoan and Tongan heritage that are being deported to New Zealand. And I just wondered if um, you were going to look at that element at all, because many of them have also never been to New Zealand or have no real connection there anymore. Yeah, um, so I'm, I'm avoiding the uh, New Zealand deportation uh, situation <laughs> because uh, 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 there's some other people working on that, but I, I do note that 60% uh, of uh, deportees from Australia to New Zealand are Māori and Pacifica. Um, and uh, uh, going back to what Lute was saying before um, around step migrants and people who have moved from the islands to New Zealand to Australia, it's, it's um, significantly in that, in that area. Um, and I, I think that, yeah, there's, there's a lot of... Um, similarities but also a lot of differences. Um, New Zealand's in an interesting position that it's not only a receiver of a lot of deportees but it's also a sender um, and so there's uh, I've done some work on the diffusion of, of those policies and how New Zealand's reintegration policies have been diffused to Samoa so I can happy to send you that. Thanks. Um, yeah, again, I'm, I'm probably more familiar with the situation of um, uh, deportations to, to New Zealand, but and one of the issues that comes up there is uh, not just people who may never have been to New Zealand, but um, uh, people who have been in Australia and uh, or essentially um, very young, young people, children even, um, and so there have been some difficulties there. Uh, are we seeing um, young people deported also back to Samoa and Tonga? And uh, is that an aspect that you're particularly looking at? And not just people that may have been in Australia, for example, for many, many years, but um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, particular issues concerning uh, young people and the con issues that may arise there. Thanks. Yeah, um, so of the data that I've received, and as I've said, there's a, it's a little bit of an issue with the data, but. Um, it doesn't look like there's any, anyone who's been deported under the age of 20 to uh, Samoa, Tonga, Cook Islands or FSN. Um, but that doesn't mean to say that we won't see more of um, Australian deportations at a younger age. We saw that one to New Zealand who was 15 not that long ago. So it doesn't mean to say it won't happen. Thanks. Are you looking at um, Are you looking um, also at the sharing of information between the sending countries um, and the receiving countries? Because um, I know that the Pacific struggled a lot with um, the information surrounding um, um, deportees and uh, a lot of our enforcement officers, um, of, um, officers um, receiving people at the airport without any information, prior information of criminal records, history. And um, when you're inheriting, inheriting um, you know, um, deportees in your country, um, let alone you know, the, the lack of information that comes with it and the facilities and the response that, and, and the capacity to even deal, particularly uh, drug related, um, you know, deportees uh, who have uh, mental health issues, who have health um, issues as well. And then just the care and the long-term, um, you know, health response. So um, is that something that you're also looking into? Because I know that um, working in, um, in the policing space um, over a number of years in the Pacific, this was something that our policing agencies struggled with, getting information. And a lot of the sending countries using um, privacy provisions mm -hmm. um, to limit um, the conversations surrounding the deportees. And, um, you know, it'll be really interesting to get your views or if you've already done some, some work around this. I have, I have done um, a bit of work around this um, quite a lot. Um, and, the, there is, uh, I, I understand from, from the Official Information Act's that, uh, request that I've made, 
that there's um, information sharing agreements that are in place um, that propose to have criminal deportation elements added to them, um, particularly within the Pacific Immigration Development Community. Um, and but I absolutely understand the struggle of, of countries. If you don't have any information, how do you put in place the correct uh, or, or an appropriate um, reintegration solution or even, you know, know how to rehome someone? Um, so, so, yes, I am looking into those issues and I know that there's work done on it, but I, I think it's um, I think it's slow and, and it, it's absolutely one of those things that's critical to, to a good reception. So, yeah, thank you very much for your comment. Thank you, everyone. I think we have time for maybe just one more question. Yes. Thank you. And uh, I have to comment on your pronunciation of uh, Tonga. Look, even me, I'm pronouncing it wrong because I pronounce it T, but it's uh, Tonga. So I can only pronounce it when I speak Tongan. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but the... Um, with your research, I know you're just starting. And do you think that there should be a, a shared responsible a responsibility between uh, the sending countries like the United States, Australia, New Zealand, uh, possibly to have maybe an integration center uh, for them to learn the language and also to develop some skills or learn how to do something before they can be sent to Tonga or to Samoa or elsewhere in the Pacific. Uh, first, because they commit the crime here. They didn't commit the crime in Tonga or elsewhere. And most of them were moved here when they're three years old or even when they're still a baby. And possibly also to, uh, because when, once they arrive to Tonga, they are free men. Uh, our law and our constitution allows them to be a free man because they didn't commit the crime in Tonga, so uh, do you think there should be a share uh, responsibility here? And I'm just thinking out loud of the uh, uh, reintegration uh, uh, center. Uh, thank you. And I think you will give me your answer, but possibly maybe it's something to include in your uh, outcome uh, research. Thank you. Malo, uh, Pito. Um, yes, I, I, I really understand what you're saying. And I think the time that between uh, someone's sentencing um, at the point where they know that that person will eventually be deported, there's actually a significant, usually a significant period of time in which they're imprisoned and then possibly in immigration detention for, for a significant period in which there are possibilities for, for an Australian or a New Zealand or, or, or US um, intervention around uh, language and culture. And, and there are, you know, we've talked today about the diaspora communities and, and how there are people here who, who could uh, facilitate those programs. And I know um, Pacifica Connect in uh, Brisbane is, is very good at supporting Pacifica who are in, um, in detention centers uh, in prison. So I, I think there are a lot of opportunities to do that. And, and I really do hope my research can to help um, uh, help policymakers to, to look into some of those opportunities and see where, see where we could go with that. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you so much for the questions and comments that were being made. I hope that you'll find those beneficial for your PhD. Um, for sharing with us your insights. Now I'll come to a close for the session and I'll hand it over to Raya. Thank you. So most of you might know me. My name is Ryan Edwards. I'm Deputy Director of the Derwent Policy Centre here. And just want to also give a huge thank you to Gemma for chairing not just one, but two sessions and doing such a fabulous job. Um, so I'd also like to welcome down, I was going to say the stage, but to the podium, Nigel Bruce, who is the Assistant Secretary of the Pacific Economic and Labour Mobility Branch at the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, who's going to kindly give us a few concluding remarks. Right. Hi everyone, thank you uh, so much for inviting me and I'll begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the presence of our good friends from the Pacific Diplomatic Corps here in Canberra, who uh, my team at work certainly knows very, very well. Um, I would also like to acknowledge and thank the ANU team for putting this event together. 
Um, and one of the reasons I was really keen to come down and, and just offer a few words is firstly to say um, that as, uh, as DFAT uh, leading the team looking after our labour mobility initiatives, um, we're really proud to support ANU uh, in its research work here um, at the Crawford School um, and our other research partners, uh, particularly in the World Bank, uh, who also look after, uh, look at these uh, topics. Um, I unfortunately was not able to, <laughs> to come at all today. You may have heard of David Little Proud saying a few words uh, in the last few days, which has taken up a lot of time uh, at work and a, a quick bit of uh, work to respond. Um, but uh, my team, members of the team have been watching online. Hi to everyone on, <laughs> online. And, and members of the team who have been here today have been keeping us all up to date with the level of discussion. And all, all I can say is that um, as a government agency with responsibility for uh, overseeing and implementing these programs and looking after Australian taxpayer money, which helps support these things, it's forums like these which are just incredibly critical to help us well, remain accountable, uh, to offer us new ideas, to be the good critical friend that we often need to make us uh, look at what we are doing and really consider how we implement things and how, how we look beyond our, uh, you know, our immediate four walls around us. Um, we always talk to our friends in the diplomatic community, we reach out to our partner governments at post, but we also need as many additional sets of eyes uh, watching us and supporting us and helping us to continually look at what we do and how we improve things. Um, I think one of the key, one of the really interesting points that was shared with me during the day from the discussion was, um, you know, for labour mobility programs in particular, we always like to, to think about how uh, these programs are of assistance to the Pacific, and particularly through remittances and the, the economic uh, development opportunities that that might bring. But we also need to contextualise that into what is it that the Pacific, through these initiatives, what is it that the Pacific is bringing to Australia and what is Australia getting out of this? We need to understand it better. We need to unpack it better. And we also need to acknowledge that contribution um, to Australian society, to our own economic development and the benefit that Australia gets out of this. Um, it's certainly, uh, it has to be much better recognised as a two-way street, uh, that in Australian industry is employing people, but Pacific uh, workers who come here, our friends from the, from the region who support those industries are also contributing a lot to Australia. Um, one of the things that we often talk about when we are meeting with our friends from the diplomatic corps is also, you know, the broader role of uh, welfare support to those workers who are here, uh, the role of the broader community in supporting those workers while they're here and the role of diaspora um, and reintegration efforts. So I was very glad to, to be able to catch some of those final discussions and some of those critical questions coming up there. Um, one of the things I really, really wanted to mention, I think it might have come up once or twice during the day, is a, a recent announcement from the government about um, open public consultations on our current Pacific Labor Mobility programs. Uh, it opened last week and so it should be open for about another five weeks or so. Uh, we, the government runs two programs. We have the Seasonal Worker Program, of course, and then also the Pacific Labor Scheme. We are looking at how we can better align those two programs, what synergies we can create, how we, how we can improve them and make them better. And so everyone in this room, having been through this discussion, it is now <laughs> your, uh, your duty to offer your ideas. Um, we've, we, as I said, we have had people watching uh, all day and listening and, and taking these ideas on, but we would absolutely love a formal submission from, from everyone and encourage you to check that, check that out. So please do go online and search for DFAT Pacific Labor Mobility Consultations and, and you'll find the relevant uh, website to submit details. Um, please do, please do uh, take the time to offer us your ideas and we would love to, love to take them on. Um, I mean, 
briefly, uh, I, I know I'm getting in the way of the end of a long day, but um, thank you very, very much for uh, your all your ongoing research and efforts. And as I said, the, the opportunity for you to share them together uh, is really, really invaluable. And we certainly want to do everything we can to take, take all of your ideas on. Um, just finally, uh, as I said before, um, there have been recent announcements in the last couple of days about labour mobility. I never thought it would end up in the media quite this much. Um, but just to say, it's still very, very early days in this work uh, about a, a new proposed visa. We don't really have many parameters in which to work with at the moment. So all I want to do for this audience in particular um, is to reassure everyone that Pacific Labour Mobility holds a very, very special place uh, in, in our hearts. Uh, all of us who work on this program really believe in it. Um, all of our colleagues over in our posts around the region uh, constantly tell us about the value uh, that it brings to our partner countries um, around the region. Uh, so we, we certainly want to see our Pacific uh, labour mobility initiatives grow from strength to strength um, to continue to improve um, and to uh, build on what we've been able to achieve so far in partnership with all of our uh, partner countries around the region. Um, so there'll still be a lot of things to work through over the coming months. I'm sure uh, parts of it will still make its way into the media, so keep an eye out for all of that. Um, but we look forward to working really closely with our friends from around the region uh, on, on continuing to build on what we've been able to achieve so far. Thank you again for indulging me in these words, uh, but I really just, just did want to emphasise that we highly appreciate the partnership we've got with ANU. All of you, your, uh, your uh, I guess, eagle-eyed uh, close views on what we do, uh, and we're always keen to, uh, to see what we can improve um, and look forward to keep working with you into the future. Thanks very much. Yes, I'll try not to take too long as well. Um, many thanks to Nigel for those kind remarks. And of course, a big thanks to DFAT for helping us create this environment for open and critical dialogue. So glad we're on the same page about that. <laughs> um, indeed, all of our work that we do here at the Development Policy Centre wouldn't be possible without the sustained support of our various funders. So yeah, we're pr pretty grateful for that. Um, to, going back to today, thank big, big thank you to all the presenters, chairs and attendees both here and out there for joining and for making it possible. I'm personally particularly happy with the mix of speakers we got, both across disciplines, genders, countries. It's turned out pretty well with myself happily probably being one of the big exceptions on that front. Um, but yeah, when we did have the idea for this workshop, the goal was to try and bring together people working on and interested in Pacific migration to share what we're working on, meet each other, talk, and then maybe even collaborate and keep in touch going forward. So far, I've had a pretty good day, um, and I think we've done that and a bit more. So again, big thank you to all of, all of you guys. Most importantly, we, this wouldn't have been possible without the phenomenal work of our centre manager, Beth Orton over there, and our communications, events, tech, and all round fixer, Arachika Okazaki. Um, and also some key inputs from Charlotte Bedford and Holly Wharton. So please join me in thanking them. Uh, <laughs> Last word, we would like to do this again. So please do let us know what you think worked well, what we could be done better and keep in touch. There's some details on the back of your lanyard and how to do so. We're not just academics here at the center, but also a think tank and a huge part of our work is trying to amplify the voices of those, not just at the ANU and trying to build a community around good development research and practice. So please do keep engaged on these issues, including the, potential, the new potential agricultural visa announced yesterday, because this is very much a live policy environment with a lot of opportunity for positive contributions and change. That's all from me. Thank you very much and yeah. Hope you had a nice day and see those of you at dinner who are coming. Yeah.